We will continue with uh, module 7 of this course on electronic systems packaging and uh, so far in this particular module the lectures that we have or the topics that we have covered included uh, all the assembly techniques and in the previous lecture we have seen the defects or in other words the failures library have been extensively dealt with and we also looked at um, lead free solder materials. So, today we are going to continue with uh, materials issue and issues like thermal profiling that um, looks very important today in the industry when you are going to assemble thousands of boards and there are certain entities like the substrate property the component properties and the solder paste material properties which together define the thermal profile. So, we are going to spend some time today on materials, phase diagram of tin lead, um, then the thermal profiles, different thermal profiles that can be set. Um, this is true if you are doing even prototyping in your lab uh, and then for the industry it becomes a very large um, item that needs careful consideration by designers, manufacturers and the EMS that is the electronics manufacturing services people uh, which includes the assembly sector. So, today's topics will be lead free material, phase diagrams, thermal profiles and we will also spend some time on green electronics that is materials that are um, banned in the industry, new materials that are being used by the industry today, so that it contributes to the green environment. The first thing that we are going to discuss today is the tin lead phase diagram. Although on the one hand we have been talking about facing away lead and using lead free materials, but academically I would like to give you some information about the reason why tin lead has been used. In countries like ours we still use tin lead, we do not have a complete legislation yet on the uh, removal or uh, banning of lead in our industry. But nevertheless our industry is also using lead free solder material to meet uh, the requirements of end customers or for uh, products that are being exported to other countries. So, if you look at a phase diagram many of you are aware of uh, what a phase diagram is. So, in this case it is a tin lead alloy. So, here on the left side you see 0 percent lead and here you can see 100 percent um, tin. Okay. Now, if you look at mixing tin, le tin lead um, individual metals to form an alloy and then if this phase diagram represents the mixing of the individual metals and you can see that the solidus and liquidus uh, portions of the tin lead um, material meets at 183 degree centigrade and that we call as the eutectic composition or eutectic uh, melting point of tin lead which corresponds to 6337 that is 63 percent of tin and 37 percent of lead. This is the very common material that is being used in the industry for decades now and the reliability of this uh, alloy solder alloy has been well established. So, alloying is a term used for a melt combination of two or more metals in this case it is tin lead. Now, what does alloying do? Alloying brings down phase transformation and therefore, changes the physical properties like melting point which is exactly what we have um, achieved by mixing uh, lead with tin. So, the 
purpose of uh, adding lead to tin is to reduce the melting point because individually the melting point of uh, tin and lead are very high. Okay. So, the main purpose of alloying is to reduce the melting point through eutectic or near eutectic phase formation. So, if you look at this diagram here, now here you see this is the um, melting point of uh, tin and here you can see 327 melting point of lead and then when these two are mixed there are various compositions that are obtained during the mixing and obviously in the electronics industry um, 6337 is not the only composition that is being used. There have been compositions like 6040 tin lead okay, and high um, lead content or high tin content uh, compositions have been used by the industry for various purposes or applications. So, this is the liquidus phase and then you can see this is bottom is the solidus phase and then you can see various compositions being formed and then the eutectic temperature is 183. Okay. So, this eutectic is 183. The composition here will be 6337. Now, there are impurities in the individual metals tin and lead. So, earlier it was assumed that 6238 would be the eutectic temperature, but because of the impurities added, it was later reassigned that including the impurities which are very difficult to remove because they are in traces. 6337 is the ideal composition at the eutectic uh, phase um, formation um, of the tin lead phase diagram. Now, the reason why I have, I have put this number here is the atomic weights of tin and lead and if you look at the um, atomic percentages of tin and lead, then it will be slightly different from the weight percentages. The 6337 that we are talking about is actually the mass weight percentage uh, compositions of tin and lead. So, one needs to understand the tin lead phase diagram, uh, because if you are choosing alloys of tin lead in electronics other than 63. 6337, you need to know the melting points uh, which will definitely be higher than 183 for all other systems. Okay. So, um, here if you look at the importance of understanding the tin lead phase diagram and why we choose 6337, uh, one of the studies that have been done over the years is that literature shows maximum shear strength of tin lead alloy at 6337 eutectic. Because when you are talking about a solder joint okay, using tin lead alloy, we are worried about the solder joint reliability. So, we need a joint that is highly reliable uh, that can withstand various thermal cycles. Um, when it when the board is powered up a printed circuit board is powered up and when it is subjected to extreme conditions of operation. So, here you can see that at the 6337 the uh, shear strength is at the maximum that gives uh, obviously, um, a most favorable condition for solder joint formation. So, there are coming back to this uh, tin lead phase diagram, uh, there are two things that we must know. You can look at weight percentage for interpreting the exact um, materials or the percentages of tin and lead or you can simply look at atomic weight percentages of tin and lead. So, you will get different compositions. So, depending upon the package, so different packages use different um, tin lead alloys. 
it is not very universal throughout. A BGA package can have 63, 37 solder balls, it can also have 60, 40 solder balls. A QFP package which has got a FE NI42 um, base frame can have a tin um, lead coating or plating okay, with composition of 6337 or 6040. In some cases flip chip we have seen they use uh, high lead content 90 uh, is to 10, 10 percentage of tin. So, you need to look at the package data sheet to understand what kind of balls, solder balls or what kind of plating has been used in the pins of SMD components or through hole components. This is very important because you are going to understand um, the effect of melting point, the solder paste melting point and the substrate TG uh, all three are very important in deciding the thermal profile of your reflow process or your wave soldering process. Typically thermal profiles are very important for doing a reflow process. In a wave obviously you are using molten solder for through hole components and a few SMD devices. So, this lecture we will focus on reflow process and the reflow thermal profile. So, what I am showing here is a, a temperature profile or a thermal profile in a reflow soldering process, let us say IR soldering. Uh, reflow soldering as you know are of three types, right. The first one could be by IR, the second one could be just by thermal convection um, air and the third one could be vapor phase. We have seen all these three types of reflow soldering processes. Now, the atmosphere for reflow could either be just air or it could be done in nitrogen atmosphere. The influence of air or nitrogen in the reflow process goes with experience and goes with the careful study of the components that are used and the solder paste material that is being used. Now, we are going to look in detail at this uh, thermal profile and typically understand what are the zones in reflow soldering process. Okay? So, we are worried about the various zones that the board undergoes. Now, for you to recollect or recap at this stage, there is a printed circuit board which has been fabricated. It could be a high density interconnect board or it could be a double sided board or a conventional multilayer board. Now, you are going to do reflow soldering let us say in air. Okay? Now, the process steps for soldering would be applying the solder paste, right? pick and place the component, do a tacky cure at room temperature or at lower temperatures for a very short time 5 to 10 minutes, then you send it to a reflow soldering. Now, at the reflow soldering the solder paste will melt, it will fuse with the component leads and then realign uh, itself, so that there is no misregistration. The surface tension of the solder is good enough to pull back the component to, to its original coordinates. So, that is the process step for soldering. Now, in a typical industrial uh, setup, when we do machine soldering, there could be various zones for reflow soldering. Now, if you look at this graph here, you will understand the various zones that are being used in a large volume setup. Typically, in a lab scale, you will have just one zone and you can easily finish the process. Of course, you can set the thermal profile for that single zone. But in industry, you can have multi zones, okay? uh, multi zones for reflow soldering. Now, you can see the terms here preheat that is a preheat zone, flux activation or you can call it as a soak zone. Then you have the more important reflow zone and then finally, a cooling zone.
Now, typically in industry, um, huge machines are available with zones perfectly defined. That means, the board will first go through the preheat zone, then the temperatures will vary for the flux activation zone and then it will go into the more important reflow. It will attain the peak reflow at this stage and then the board will be slowly cooled down to room temperature. Cooling should be a very slow process. You should not immediately remove the board after the peak reflow is done because that will be a bit of a thermal shock. Therefore, cooling process also has to be well defined. Now, the terms referred here, okay, I will try to explain. We start with the room temperature, let us say 25, then it slowly moves uh, to a predefined temperature, let us say that is known as the uh, preheat peak minimum temperature and uh, maximum temperature can be defined. So, typically somewhere here could be your first year mark for defining the preheat zone from room temperature. So, this could be typically from 25 degree centigrade to let us say 150 degree centigrade depending upon your TG of the board. You want to activate the board, you want to activate the uh, interconnects, the copper and then you are also removing moisture from the components. Remember we talked about moisture entrapment in capacitors, in BGA packages, in epoxy packages and so on. So, when you are having such a situation where you might be having uh, a large number of epoxy based packages or uh, tantalum capacitors, ceramic capacitors, you want to remove the heat slowly, gradually. Um, so, you do not want to hurry up this preheat zone. Okay. So, this typically should be done at uh, 2 degree centigrade per second and you can have a preheat zone dwelling time of about 90 to 110 seconds. Okay. So, that is the kind of guideline that I can give you for preheat zone. Now, once the preheat maximum temperature has been reached, you now move into the activation zone. The important point here that you have to consider is activation zone will be crucial for the solder paste getting activated. Now, let me take your attention to the bottom of the slide where I have talked about flux based soaking times. The solder paste contains flux as you all know. Okay. It also includes some kind of an adhesive because it helps in pick and place it contains an epoxy media and it contains flux. Flux is necessary for soldering, we have seen. It improves wetting, um, it uh, prevents corrosion and so on. We have also seen different kinds of fluxes in our previous um, lectures. So, the dwell time for soaking zone should be based on what kind of flux you are using in the solder paste. If you are using a low activated flux, then it is known as a low activated solder paste. The dwell time should be larger compared to a standard flux where the dwell time is about a minute or so and then if it is a highly activated flux, that means the flux in the solder paste is already activated, then you can reduce your soaking time. So, typically from let us say in this case 150 to um, a range where you are going to start the reflow process. Now, here this is the peak reflow and this is the guideline that you need to uh, have when uh, the information like the melting point of the solder paste needs to be very clearly understood. Suppose you are using a solder paste which melts at 230 degree centigrade. So, your peak reflow should hover around 230. Okay. So, ideally you would like to keep about 2 degrees to 5 degrees more than the defined melting point of the solder paste. So, typically your peak reflow 
in this case could be 235 degree centigrade if the melting point of the solder paste is around 230. So, the reflow zone actually starts from here and then goes up to this point right. So, the rate of heating will be different for preheating zone, soaking zone and the reflow zone. Reflow zone activity should be fairly uh, less time consuming because you do not want to expose the board, the components and uh, exceed the um, temperatures that are defined for thermal shock of components and so on. Soaking zone can be large. Okay. So, typically uh, from 150 degree centigrade to let us say 210 or 220 can be a typical reflow profile for a solder paste which is melting at 230. Then from 210 to 235 can be your reflow zone. Soaking temperatures like for example, it should be very slow 0.5 degree centigrade or 0.75 degree centigrade or maximum 1 degree centigrade per second should be the heating rate that you should uh, set in your equipment for the activation zone or the soaking zone. So, that your solder paste works up quite slowly. The advantage is that there would not be any solder bead formation, there would not be any uh, spattering of the um, solder paste material and you will have a very good activated solder paste ready to reflow. At this stage all the solvents are gone, the flux is activated and the thin lead is ready to fuse with your component leads. So, from 210 to 235 will be your reflow zone. This should be fairly fast okay, 1.5 degree centigrade to 2 degree centigrade per second. And then you can have uh, a very small residence time here at the peak reflow for about uh, 5 to 10 seconds. Okay. In some cases it could be larger and then you can start the cooling zone. So, cooling has to be gradual, you cannot immediately remove the board from the cooling zone and then try to finish your process faster. Remember uh, from 235 degree centigrade to room temperature has to be done at something like 3 degree centigrade per second or 4 degree centigrade per second. So, the entire process you can expect from the 4 stages that we have defined preheating zone, the flux activation zone, the reflow zone and the cooling zone typically should end in about 5 to 6 minutes. Okay. So, again we are talking about industry, we are talking about yield throughput for this machine. Therefore, even 5 to 6 minutes uh, could uh, assume to be a larger time, but again the industry people know better in terms of what kind of combinations of components material and they are using. So, in any case uh, in a reflow zone you can accommodate quite a few boards okay, in a particular batch and depending upon the conveyor belt size and so on. Therefore, uh, it can never it can never be less than 5 minutes. Okay. So, a process cycle typically takes about 5 to 6 minutes. So, this is what information I would like to give about what a thermal profile because we have been talking about thermal profile for some time now and you need to know very important issues regarding time for reflow time for activation, preheating and cooling and then the various temperatures that you need, you have flexibility in defining these points. This is left to you. As a designer also you need to understand this, if you understand this you can interact with your assembly guys much better and you can get a product that is a finished board in a much better reliable uh, condition. Now, this is another thermal profile for reflow soldering. The earlier one you can see the shape of the thermal profile is quite different, right. 
Now here you can see that there is no residence time, there is a peak here. There is no residence time for the board um, uh, that the board spends at the peak reflow zone. So that depends again on your judgment of all the various parameters. Now let us look at what are the zones here. On this axis you have the temperature, you have the time, okay, time in seconds, temperature. Then uh, this is the room temperature you, you are going to start with. Then this is the ramp up zone. Okay, straight away you are ramping up to the soak zone. The soak zone starts here. Here you can see compared to the previous slide, the soak zone is maintained at a particular temperature. Here temperature is constant. Okay, temperature is constant for a particular time. Then the ramp up to the peak reflow starts. Unlike the earlier one where you had a residence time, here the peak reflow is attained and immediately it starts cooling. Okay. This is very useful when you have narrow process windows based on the um, melting point of the solder or the TG of the substrate or the type of flux that is used. Uh, in, in some cases if it is a very reliable solder paste material and if you are very sure of, of the reflow process being done at a, a, a smaller window, um, let us say plus minus 2 degree centigrade then this kind of profile can be used. But if you are using uh, materials which you have not um, used before or if it has having low activated paste then you want to keep more residence time. Uh, at the peak reflow. So, these are the two basic thermal profiles that you can see in literature today and you can fine tune it or change it according to your requirement. So, once again here we have cooling typically for example, 2 to 4 degrees centigrade per second. It is up to you to have a uh, more dwelling time at the peak reflow or you can go up to the peak reflow and then get back to the cooling zone immediately. And then here the most important thing visible uh, striking difference between the previous uh, graph and this one is that the board spends a considerable amount of time in the soaking zone. Now the important things anyway which you must consider for any thermal profiling is that look at the TG. Is it a low TG? substrate or high TG substrate. Then you can fix your process window ideally according to that. Today most people are using FR4 uh, with a TG of around 190 degree centigrade. So, you have more flexibility in defining the preheat zone. Then the other thing I want to repeat melting temperature of solder alloy that is to be used. In certain cases you have a problem. If you look at the entire bill of materials, your component list, there will be one component which says this component should not exceed 230 degree centigrade for more than 45 seconds. The component is vulnerable to such a residence time during soldering. So, in such cases, you have to be very careful in deciding the peak reflow or choosing the right type of solder paste for mounting that component or if it is only a single component in the entire batch then you can do a hand soldering of that component if it is feasible. Otherwise these considerations become very important. The other thing is solder alloy composition and then the population density of components on your PCB. Remember if you have a high density board you can do reflow soldering, parts of it can be done by manual soldering like your through hole connectors and a few through hole components and you can do double reflow that is if you have double sided assembly then the board can be subjected to twice reflow. So, this is the maximum generally as a guideline as a rule of thumb you can take it that a double sided board assembly can undergo thermal shock through soldering process twice 
typically dual reflow plus a few components that have been uh, to be mounted by manual soldering. If you have to use wave soldering let us say then it could be one wave one reflow okay, or it should be dual wave for double sided if you have such a kind of a choice of components. If you have two reflow processes and then a wave then it becomes too much of a thermal shock for the substrate as well as a few components. So, um, use your judgment in understanding the layout of your board vis a vis the assembly process. Now, what I am going to show here is a problem for us to work out today and see how we can understand because I feel for designers this is a very important issue. Very often the board is manufactured and then you give your components to an assembly um, personnel in a EMS and then if you do not interact with them on the uh, subtleties involved um, which will make a large count for reliability then you have problem. Therefore, I like to spend a few more minutes on uh, understanding thermal profile because as a designer if you can give this information to the EMS then your board comes out well assembled. So, I will take a simple example, uh, I will read it out a PCB assembly has to utilize reflow soldering let us say IR or it could be thermal that is not a major issue. The following details are available for the process, the process is not done in nitrogen atmosphere that means it is done in air temperature in reflow zone can be plus minus 1 degree centigrade okay that is the kind of setting because it is done in nitrogen atmosphere FR4 substrate is used for this assembly and with a TG of 160 degree centigrade and the PCB has a tin plating finish right not tin lead tin plating finish. The solder paste with mildly activated flux is used in uh, the solder paste alloy that is a SAC305 alloy. So, SAC305 alloy is basically um, tin, silver, copper alloy where the percentage of tin is 3 and copper is 0.5 percent which has a melting point of 217 degree centigrade. It is a 100 percent surface mount device assembly. There are 4 high pin count BGAs plastic BGAs that are used others are small outline ICs, passives etcetera. The reason why I am giving this uh, information is that if you have a high pin count PBGAs let us say there are 800 solder balls to be soldered then you have to give more residence time okay, for all the flux that is being used under the plastic BGA to get activated. You must also consider giving more residence time at the reflow zone so that you will not end up with a plastic BGA where 30 percent of the solder balls are not at all attached or reflowed. Okay. Uh, so, make a point about this the reason why I am giving this in your board in your system you could encounter such uh, day to day problems. The most vulnerable component among the entire components that are being used in this design can withstand 235 degree centigrade for 60 seconds only. So, that clearly defines your peak reflow zone residence time. It is recommended to have a one step reflow only. Okay. BGAs are large that means, if it is a double sided board then one side undergoes a reflow the other side undergoes another reflow process only there is no other re, uh, process involved here. BGAs are large so that is also given here 43 by 43 mm. So, draw a graph time versus temperature for the thermal profile and answer the questions below. Suggest start and end temperatures from room temperature to peak reflow, mention heating rates in each zone including the cooling zone, indicate board dwell times in all the zones. Okay. 
So, now we are going to work out this problem. Now, if you are going to assume this kind of a graph, okay, then what are the parameters that you can set? The first thing that if you look at the problem um, is that the vulnerable temperature for components is 235 degrees centigrade, right? Component vulnerability, we have seen there is a component which um, if it exceeds 235 degrees centigrade for 60 seconds, then it is vulnerable for failure. Therefore, you can keep the peak reflow temperature at 235, let us say minus 5 degrees centigrade, which could be 230 C. That is the first information that you can get. Then the solder paste melting temperature is known, it is given to you that is 217 degree centigrade. Okay. So, that information you have. right? Now, the peak reflow temperature time because we have talked about the component. So, the peak reflow um, time can be kept as 30 seconds. Okay. It is a tight guideline uh, process window but 30 seconds is accepted. Now, the other things that you can consider is the ramp up rate in the preheat zone is what you have to consider now. Preheat zone is um, typically we can choose 2 degree centigrade per second first thing. The second thing is um, soaking zone or the activation zone here you can keep 0.5 degree centigrade per second. Then the third one to achieve peak reflow that is to go into the reflow zone, uh, you can keep it at 2 degree centigrade per second because if you look at the problem, it uses mildly activated flux. So, the soaking zone, uh, zone it is fairly slow, but you can keep it for a longer time. Okay. So, this can be uh, 2 degree centigrade, although um, ranges are different we have seen. Now, the cooling zone, cooling zone can be 2 to 4 degree centigrade, but we will keep it as 3 degree centigrade per second. So, these are the basic analysis that we have done. Now, so this is time temperature and here we can keep it as 30 seconds peak reflow and this is 230 degree centigrade. Okay. Now, the other one here if this is 2 degree centigrade per second, 2 degree centigrade per second then we can have um, this temperature around 217 degree centigrade, then we can have this as 200 degree centigrade and then here it could be around 150 degree centigrade. So, preheat zone this is 25 degree centigrade room temperature uh, typically could be uh, if it is at 2 degree centigrade per second. So, 25 to 150 degree centigrade this could end up in 62.5 seconds. Then we have the soaking zone or the activation zone we said it is 0 0.5 degree centigrade per second. right? So, this could be 100 seconds. These are ideal because we have seen the conditions for this board. Then this one the ramp up which is at 2 degree centigrade per second, this will be around um, 21.5 seconds. Then this is 30 seconds we have seen residence time then you can create a window here this one this could be about 4 seconds and then the cooling takes place uh, at 3 degree centigrade per second. So, this will be over in about 64 seconds. So, if you add up the total time requirement from start to finish could be about 275 seconds. So, less than 5 minutes the entire board 
is uh, going through the various zones including the cooling zone and then the we can expect uh, that the flux is activated properly the solder paste, uh, solder paste is um, melted completely because of the volumes involved especially a plastic BGA which is used and uh, in this particular problem we are talking about 4 such plastic BGAs of a large size that is 43 by 43 and this is a good guideline okay. So, you can work on this problem and if you have any other suggestions as to how you can improve this total time uh, and the temperature um, definitions for the various zones you can work out and then get back to me by email. So, this is one situation that we have worked out. Now, the other problem that also I would like to if you are looking at the same problem using the other thermal profile. Okay. So, here again uh, various con same considerations the T g is 160 okay. then the melting point is 217 degree centigrade for the solder paste. Then the vulnerable component thermal shock is at uh, 235 degree centigrade for 30 seconds. So, now you can start from the room temperature the same condition supply you are going to give more preheating or soaking zone time. So, you can keep uh, typically about um, 125 to 160 let us say 160 could be your um, temperature. So, from room temperature to 160 you can go at a heating rate of about uh, um, 2 degree centigrade per second this could be 2 degree centigrade per second. Then the soaking time you can keep it for longer time 0 0.5 degree centigrade per second at 160 you can keep for a longer time. Then from 160 if you set the peak reflow to 225 there is no residence time as such. Uh, so, from 160 to 225 is your ramp up time at the rate of let us say uh, 2 degree centigrade per second 2 degree centigrade per second. Then your cooling zone typically again 3 degree centigrade per second. So, 225 to 25. So, if you calculate the times accordingly you will get the total time okay. for each of these you can calculate the time and then totally you can get the time taken for reflow if you are using. The only difference that you see here is the T g of the board is 160. So, you are utilizing that uh, temperature um, to ramp up in the preheating zone. So, from room temperature then at 160 uh, because you are also talking about the flux. So, this could slightly be changed you can split this soaking zone into two zones. Okay. So, from 160 to 180, 190 you can have a, a quick ramp up and then from 190 to 225 you can have the reflow ramp ramp up. So, that could be modified. So, you can also consider modifying this zone based on the information that we have. So, this is also workable because you are trying to activate the uh, entire system at 160 degree centigrade and then you are mo moving from 160 to 225 without a residence time and then getting back to room temperature gradually. So, typically this also you should end up in about 225 seconds sorry 225 uh, seconds which is less than 5 minutes and acceptable for the industry process. So, the underlining point the takeaway from these two slides that I have talked about is that there is no consistent thermal profile or a universal thermal profile it depends on the system that you are using. So, look at all the issues carefully look at the problem that you have in terms of components substrate and paste and th then draw your own thermal profile 
do a trial run 3 to 4 times on a board, look at the solder joint, examine the solder joint visually and then go ahead if it is a mass production. So, what I intend to do now is give you a homework problem. So, look at this homework problem, the entities are slightly different here, the temperatures are different here and then you can also try at home how to arrive at a thermal profile for such a system and then you can email me or uh, post your comments on the web. Now, getting back to some more basics of the um, solder system. If we talk about thin lead, there is always an intermetallic layer that is formed. If you talk about a, a system like this, okay, this is copper, we talk about base metal in a PCB, this is copper, this is let us say tin lead solder material. Now, this is what happens when you do soldering, solder gets attached to the copper and once that alloying happens, the intermetallics are immediately formed. As the temperature increases, the intermetallic layer thickness also increases. Even at room temperature over a period of time, the intermetallic thickness grows. So, initially there will be a particular phase or a composition or a compound and if the board has been used for a longer time let us say and if you analyze the layer thicknesses, there will be difference in the thicknesses. That is because the intermetallic growth phenomenon is continuous and if it is done at higher temperatures or if it is subject to higher temperatures, the growth rate is very high. That is why I have put this graph here to show typically temperature versus microns per second growth rate and you can see for copper it is this is the temperature. So, as we move up the temperature, um, we can see the growth rate um, for copper fairly high, gold, silver, palladium, platinum and so on. We have also seen in our earlier class that when you have copper and if you want to plate gold on copper, you need to have an undercoat of nickel to uh, prevent diffusion of gold into copper. So, the intermetallic properties are dependent on the alloying system the plating, the base metal and the plating that it takes and the multiple coatings that normally we do with the printed circuit board cross sections. So, typically in a printed circuit board you will have base copper, then you can have a nickel gold coating on which you can do a solder, um, sol soldering process done for components. So, then you will have much more complex uh, intermetallics that could be formed. The only thing is it, the gold can prevent a diffusion of tin lead into copper. But if you look at this picture here as a cross section, what it uh, says is basically at the area close to the base metal, you will have base metal rich compounds. What are the base metal rich compound interfaces? Typically Cu3 Sn. Then on the solder side, you will have solder rich compound typically. Cu6 SN5. Cu6 SN5 is solderable, Cu3 SN is brittle and non solderable. That is why um, you have to make sure that the soldering process is done on a clean copper surface. And if you try to repeatedly do desoldering and soldering on the same surface, you will not get a wet joint because of the um, different intermetallic layer that is formed and which is not uh, amenable for soldering process. So, intermetallic growth is common in all solid state systems. It is caused by solid state diffusion of one metal into another metal's lattice structure. Rate of diffusion depends on the crystal structure of each of the metals. Therefore, you have to solder as quickly as possible 
use lowest possible temperature that yields acceptable joints, avoid repeated soldering this will increase the thickness of the intermetallic layer as I told you. Any board any system which is having tin lead if you repeatedly solder desolder and repair your components the reliability is going to go down. Intermetallic layer growth uh, takes place at any temperature even at room temperature and at lower temperatures and at high temperatures nevertheless as I mentioned it is faster. Some of the common electronic solder alloys and their designations will now be discussed. So, we have seen tin, uh, tin 62, lead 36 and 2 percent of silver added normally to reduce the melting point from 183 to 179. This has been in practice for surface mount device assembly for a long time now you get a very good joint more wettability more mechanical strength to the component leads and it has a much better um, appearance and finish. So, the common one is 6337 okay, which includes impurities of course, then the melting point 183 used for through hole components SMD hybrid devices and so on. I talked about 6040 is also possible. Uh, melting point range is 183 to 191 used in SMD and hybrids. Then you have some uh, uncommon uh, solder alloys like tin is 96.3, silver 3.7, melting point 221. This is high melting lead free uh, material. So, if you are using system uh, away from the normal eutectic then you have to look at your thermal profile in a different way. I also talked about the possibility of high lead content, low tin content, temperatures are very high, some BGAs and flip chip uh, bumps are being have been manufactured uh, before the ROHS legislations. Even today I uh, assume that um, certain packages very few in number are still being allowed to use this because of um, the reliability issues and so on. So, again 97 3 percent tin C 4 flip chip um, manufacturers have been using that. So, temperatures are very high ok. Um, now, of course, C 4 flip chip are available with uh, uh, lead free materials. And this is another um, such example from the literature that we have. So, academically uh, this table gives you the various um, compositions of tin lead, silver that have been practiced uh, in assembly. Now, look at best alternatives for lead because now we are moving away from lead. We have to look at alternatives for lead. So, the best thing or the best bet would be SAC 305 alloy and in some cases people are using SAC 405 alloy. Now, what is SAC 305? SAC 305 indicates that there is 3 percent silver in that and 0.5 percent copper and the remaining percentage that is 96.5 percent is um, tin. So, it is a more tin based lead is removed and replaced by silver and copper adopted by the Japanese and then but being synthesized by major um, solder companies and it is available in India elsewhere and is being uh, extensively used for SMD assembly. The other one is SSC 405 alloy. So, here you have about 4 percent of silver. Uh, 0.5 percent uh, copper or it, they say uh, some literature gives it as 3.9 percent silver and 0.6 percent copper and the remaining 95.5 percent tin adopted by NEMI that is the National Electrical Manufacturers Initiative of US. So, silver provides mechanical strength. So, why do we use silver? Uh, it improves the resistance to fatigue from thermal cycles. 
The use of copper in this alloy it lowers the melting point, improves resistance to thermal cycle fatigue and improves the wetting properties of solder. In some cases tin has been alloyed with bismuth. So, tin bismuth alloys are known it might be prohibit prohibitive in terms of cost uh, and in terms of application um, bismuth might not be a good choice, but in certain cases it is acceptable it lowers the melting point and improves the wettability. Tin indium alloys are known expensive though lowers the melting point and improves the ductility. Uh, zinc if it is used in any of the tin alloys for lead free lowers the melting point and is low cost, but it is susceptible to corrosion. So, you do not want to really use that antimony is added to increase the strength very small percentage. So, these are the best alternatives for lead free solder. So, lower melting uh, melting point lead free solder alloys most of them melt at higher temperatures than than tin lead. To lower the melting point use indium or bismuth possess better rework and repair characteristics. For example, if you talk about indium as the component with the in the tin uh, lead free alloy tin is 48 percent you can see the melting point is very low quite low lower than the eutectic uh, tin lead useful for temperature sensitive components. So, this is the ideal requirement or application when you are using this because some today in certain um, electronic products the components that are being used are sensitive to higher temperatures. Cost and availability is a problem. Bismuth alloys uh, you can see the melting point is 138 quite low the percentage of tin is 42 and bismuth is 58 cost is comparative to tin, but it creates brittleness and poor fatigue resistance. The disadvantages are reduction in wetting property and special flux is required. So, there are advantages in using lead free alloys like the lowering of the melting point, but at the same time if you look the bottom line you have problems in terms of the reliability in terms of wetting fatigue um, resistance um, and so on. And obviously, there have been some applications where these are used, but they are more special in nature. So, we will continue with the lead free alloys and then move into um, green electronics. We will discuss some of the issues um, that are affecting the electronics industry globally in terms of material choices for green products.